I'm Landon Witsit. Welcome back to Theo Academy's series on preparation for ordered ministry. As elders and deacons who have been called to lead the church, one of our first responsibilities is to recognize who we actually are in relationship to God. We may be fearful or excited about this calling we have undertaken, but in either case, I'm sure that you feel like I do, that the responsibility of leading the church in the mission of God is a serious one, one that we want to do well. We just need to know how to do it. Our book of order begins like this. The good news of the gospel is that the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creates, redeems, sustains, rules, and transforms all things and all people. The Presbyterian Church has decided to say that any consideration of who or what the church is has to begin with a consideration of who God is and what God is up to. The good news of the gospel is not about us. It's about God. Well, we have to start with God because the, uh, the church depends on God, but God does not depend on the church. So when we... Uh, Christians talk about God, we understand that God is a triune God, uh, an eternal fellowship of love, a fellowship that has no beginning and, and no end. So God uh, is, is the one who, out of that overflowing love, brings a whole world into being. So we have to go all the way back to the beginning of what God has been up to in the world to think about the church. So we, as the church, uh, recognize God as our creator, the one who brings us into being. God is our redeemer, the one who comes to us in mercy, who forgives and reconciles us in Jesus Christ. And God is the one who promises us eternal life who promise us, us a new heavens and a new earth where there is no longer any crying or pain. So the church understands uh, that it is utterly dependent on this God, uh, that God is, is the, the source of its, its life and, and strength. Well, the church is God's creature. God brings it into being. God gives it breath and, and life. So the church is not its own maker and keeper. We often talk in a kind of loose way about the church gathering itself for worship, the church gathering itself for mission, but really I think what we mean is that God is gathering the church. Uh, God is the one who sends the church out, out into the world. Uh, so that I think also helps us understand that when we, we look around the church, what we see are people who have been gathered by God, people who are there by Christ's invitation, not by our invitation. Um, we don't set the rules for, for membership in God's church. I think to say that, that God gathers the church is not to let us off the hook, as if we simply sit passively by ourselves and, and God will bring in whoever God will bring in. But I do think it is to say that the church is ultimately God's church and, and not ours. And that this means uh, the church will always be something of a motley crew. <laughs> uh, because God is, is a God of, of all people, uh, all nations, all languages. Uh, so the church is always going to be bigger than anything we could come up with on our own. And it, it means, I think, trusting uh, that, that God is, is finally uh, the, the God of the church and that we can, we can welcome and embrace uh, those that, that come our way. So the first thing the church exists to do is to worship. We gather in praise and thanksgiving to sing, to pray, to hear God's word, to receive God's promises in tangible, visible ways in, in the sacrament, to hear God's purposes for our lives. There is no higher goal for us as human beings than to glorify and enjoy God forever. Worship, however, is not the only thing the church is called to do. 
God sends the church. God sends the church into the world that God loves. Sends the church to proclaim the good news of God's reconciliation in Christ. Sends the church to work with others for the flourishing of all creation. God's mission is always bigger than anything we can get our heads around. So the church in its mission is always following at a distance. <laughs> it's always recognizing that it is caught up in something much bigger than itself. Um, but it is given a place in God's purposes. And so there's something joyful about its witness. We believe as Christians that we've been given an important part in God's purposes, that we are given the role of proclaiming and celebrating God's reconciliation of the world in Jesus Christ. But as the Second Helvetic Confession says, God has friends outside the commonwealth of Israel. So that means we don't subscribe to a kind of trickle-down ecclesiology, as if all of God's relating to the world has to happen through the church. We believe that we are called to be part of God's mission. We are called to follow at a distance the many innumerable things God is doing in the world, and we witness in joy and in celebration of God's goodness. Even if we recognize that the mission we are a part of is God's mission, there is still a little something extra that we need to say. We might be tempted to look at God's mission and see it as our charge, our responsibility alone to get it done at any cost. But Presbyterians want to talk about it in a different way. The language we use is that Christ is the head of the church, that Christ calls and equips the church, that Christ gives the church its life. I think when we say that Christ is the head of the church, there's both a, a positive and a negative dimension to that. The negative dimension, I think, is that Christ is the head, we are not. So that reminds the leaders of the church that they are not the church's head, uh, that they are followers of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. But I think there's also, of course, a positive side to it, and, and that is the sense that we are the body of Christ in the world. We are the hands and feet of Christ in the world. And so the, to, to say that Christ is the head means that we look to Christ for our guidance. Uh, we read in the Gospels about Christ's teaching and healing and, and reaching out to outcasts, and we, we take that as, as the guide for how we should be in the world. Uh, we recognize that uh, we never do this perfectly, uh, that we never uh, can take over the reins, so to speak, uh, that we, we always remain followers and, and, and not um, the uh, replacements for, for Christ. Um, but it, it is uh, an important centering of the church in, in its identity to say, we do not follow ourselves, we, we follow Christ. Another claim we make about Christ and his relationship to the church is that Christ is the church's hope. First of all, we have the promise that Christ will never forsake us. So we, we know that we are never in this on our own. And Second, we believe that in the resurrection, Christ is already the inaugurator of God's new reign. So we are participating in something that has already been done, has already been proclaimed. Uh, so we, we, are, we are not the, the startup crew, you know, the one who has to get this whole thing off the ground. Uh, we are the, the ones who are asked to follow the, the risen Christ, to live into the new life that, that he is already bringing into our midst. And, and that is a, a, a great foundation for hope. John Calvin, on, in one of his many difficult days in the ministry, uh, wrote, I would despair if I forgot 
that it is always Christ who is building up the church. So I, I think when we say that Christ is the church's hope, uh, it is to uh, give ourselves the permission to recognize that the church is often weak, it's often struggling, it's broken, but we do not have to despair because we do not finally depend on ourselves. We trust, we trust Christ, we trust the risen Christ, the one who has conquered death, who has conquered sin, and we, we look to him for, for our hope. I, I love that, that place where the Apostle Paul says, uh, all God's promises are yes in Christ. And, and I think that's what the church has to, has to hang on to. On the opposite side, the church can easily become, in, in the words of several hymns, haughty. It might be easy for us to look at the amazing things that God is doing in our community and decide that God is doing them because we are somehow special. But the church must always be careful to not fall into this way of thinking. We just may not be the end all and be all of God's plans for the world. God's mission is always bigger than the church's mission. Um, that God is, is always um, alive and, and present and at work in the world. Uh, and that we, we shouldn't think that the, the, therefore that the church's mission exhausts God's mission. God is up to all kinds of things in the world. Um, and and it's, it's always you know, beyond our, our grasp as the church. Um, but that isn't a reason to be discouraged or, or to, to feel um, not very important. Um, but to, to say, yes, you know, God is, is up to this enormous mission in the world and, and we are called to be part of it. We are called to be a part of it. It's a beautiful thing when you get right down to it. God is up to some amazing things in the world. God doesn't actually need our help with any of it, but this same God has decided to call us to be a part of it anyway. This same God has chosen to include us in the marvelous mission of transforming all things and all people. We'll see you next time.